Okay, Bruchim Habeim, everybody. Welcome to the Shear on Parshas Piku Day. And uh, anybody who'd like to sponsor a Shear, by the way, please let us know. It's really a wonderful opportunity to dedicate a Shear for whatever purpose you particularly would like to, but it certainly is worthwhile. Please let me know. Even tonight, if you'd like to dedicate the Shear, please communicate with me and let me know that you'd like to sponsor. Uh, I'd like to just mention that we're going to be learning tonight's shir uh, for Fuwa Shalema for my Choshev Talmud Menachem Mordechai Ben Ophira. And we all mention his name very, very often in the Shul every Shabbos. And he joins us very often on the shir. And I, don't, I suppose tonight is no different. So, Buchim Abba'im, and welcome to everyone on Parshas Pekude. We're going to start by going to a share, uh, a share screen right away. And we're going to uh, highlight the, uh, the screen. Let's see if we have the right one here. Okay, here we are. All right, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna get another one actually too. And I'd like to show you this particular one uh, even before this. Okay, here we go. I'd like to I'd like to emphasize this particular share. Do you see this share now on the sector bracha? Do you see it? We are yeah, quoting yeah. in Sechta Brachos, Lamed right. Beis, Amid Beis, to start the Shia tonight. As you know, Pekude is the last of the 11 Parshios. There are 11 different Parshios in Chumash Shemos. I just want to remember, me, uh, reiterate what we learned from the Ramban at the very beginning of Shemos, and that is that Chumash Shemos could be divided up into three sections very easily. Right. The first four parshios could be, uh, which are Shmos, Erebo, and Bishala, could be called Exodus, because those are the four parshios in which the Jewish people left Egypt. And then you could take the next two parshios of Yisro and Mishpatim, and you could easily call them Torah, because in Yisro, the Ten Commandments were given, the Torah was given, and in Mishpatim, we have the largest number of mitzvahs in the Torah up to that point, Total of 51 gan, uh, three. 53 mitzvahs, excuse me, uh, uh, gan mitzvahs uh, in, in Mishpatim. So Yisra and Mishpatim would be Torah. And then Teruma, the next five, Teruma, Tetzavah, Kisisa, Yachal, and Pekude would be called Mishkan, or the building of the house of Hashem. It could be divided up into three, but it wasn't. It was made into one whole Torah, one whole section of the Torah. And the reason is, let's reiterate, and refresh our memories, because going out of Mitzrayim and being free is absolutely crucial to every Jew. Freedom is paramount. There's no question about it, but it's not an end in and of itself. Freedom is no more than a means to an end. And the means to the end of freedom, the purpose of freedom, you would think is to get the Torah. That would be a good thing. The purpose of freedom is to get the Torah, but the Torah doesn't stop there. It doesn't say that the purpose of freedom is to get the Torah. The getting of the Torah is only one step on the road to the ultimate fulfillment of the purpose of freedom, and that is the setting up and the building of the kingdom of Hashem on earth. And that, of course, is represented by the building of the Mishkan. And therefore, Exodus, the whole book of Shmos, begins with freedom, has the giving of the Torah as the purpose of enabling us to get to the ultimate goal, which is the setting up of the kingdom of Hashem on earth. We, the Jewish people, over the past 3,330 odd years have been the repositories of this repository of this Torah, and our goal is ever in our sights. Constantly, we are viewing the long term. We have a very long view, as the Ramban used to say a very, very long view. We look ahead, way, way ahead, and we're sure about the ultimate outcome. Ultimately, there's no question that the kingdom of God will be established on earth, but it's gonna be through our efforts and through our trials and tribulations that ultimately that's gonna happen. So the beginning of the of Chumash Shmos, uh, we learned this idea of dividing it up into three, and tonight we're mentioning about Pekude, which is the last Parsha in Shmos, and at the end, what do we say? What do we say when we finish Parshas Pekudei? Chazak, chazak, how do we translate 
Chazak, Chazak, Venis, Chazak. It means be strong, be strong, and let's get ever stronger. Let us strengthen ourselves. This is partly based on a statement we have right in front of us on the share. If you'll take a look here, we're going to show it to you right now. I'm going to bring the, uh, the little hand right here. Here it is. Tanu Rabbanan. This is Daf Lamed Beis in Berachos. I don't have the Daf in front of you, but I have the statement with its translation right in front of us. It says Tanu Rabbanan. The Rabbanan learned Arboa Tzrichim Chizuk. There are four things that need strengthening, that constantly must be strengthened and bolstered with Siyata Deshmaya, with the help of Hashem. What are the, the Eluhain? Here are the four things. Torah is number one. Ma'asim Tovim is number two. Number three is Tefillah. And number four is Derech It's interesting. Let's take a look how Safari translates these four things. Number one, the first thing is Torah. Clear, no question about that. Second, Gimilus Chasodim is called good deeds. Tfila is called prayer. The last one, Derech Eretz. So a lot of people think Derech Eretz means being respectful, but that's not the real translation. It's occupation. It means work, business. It means what we do in order to survive in this world. So these four things need constant strengthening. And I want to just spend two minutes on this once again. Because it's crucial to remember. Question, I was saying, and you can join in and pipe in if you'd like to say something at this point. Why did our Chazal, in their wisdom and brilliance, tell us that these things need strengthening? Wouldn't we think that the Torah is strong enough to stand on itself, prayer on itself, occupation on itself, and good deeds on itself? Why do they need strengthening? What's the reason that they need strengthening? What would you think? Why do we have to strengthen these things? Anybody like to uh, offer a suggestion? Okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll just throw it right out and see if you enjoy this particular interpretation. The reason that these, these things need strengthening is because each and every one of them has a downside. Let me explain what I mean by that. Let's take the first one, Torah. Torah needs strengthening. Let's use an example. We are finishing Parshas Pekudeh. There are thousands there's over a thousand psukim in Chumash Mos, well over a thousand psukim in the entire Chumash. And Mordechai, if you have an opportunity, you can tell us exactly how many psukim there are in Chumash Mos, but there are well over a thousand psukim in Chumash Shemos. So if you take the, all those thousands of psukim and we say to ourselves, okay, I spent the last 11 weeks learning Chumash Shemos. If I followed the halacha that was supposed to do Shnayim Rikav Echad Targum, I read each Pesach two times, at least. And I've also read the translation. In addition, I may have learned the Rashi. So I've studied over a thousand Pesachim. I've also learned the Rashi. And I've also learned the Targum. Question, do I know and understand each and every one of these psukim? I'll have to admit that I don't. I'm, I'm working at getting there. I'm trying to understand them all, but I don't have it all. Will I have more the next time I learn Shmos? Oh, definitely. I will know more the next time I learn Shmos. I'll, I'll discover a new Ramban that I didn't delve into before, or I'll, or I'll pick up on a Balaturim, or I'll see an Orachayim, or I'll understand the Yonah Sen ben Uziel translation or something along those lines. And that will enhance my knowledge of Shmos. But I don't know it yet. So a person could say to themselves, you know, I've spent so many hours, so many weeks, so many years learning Shmos. And I still don't know it all. Oh, you might say to yourself, give up. There's no point in going on. You can't master it all anyway. Oh, so 1213. Yes? 1213. Right? 1,213 Sukkim. Is that right? Thank you so much. Right? Yeah. There we go. 1,213 Sukkim. Thank you to our statistician, Mordechai Ratzstein. So it's 1,213 Sukkim, and we don't know them all. How many do we know? Can anybody say I know 600 of them well? 
Wow, that's a good accomplishment. And then we go to the Rashi. Can we know all the Rashis and so on? So therefore, we have to strengthen ourselves and say, don't give up. We do not give up. It's not now a card. We're going to keep learning and we're going to get chizit. We need chizit. We have to strengthen ourselves. Make ourselves strong. We learned one more pasuk this year than last year. Unbelievable. We're on the road. We're building the kingdom of God on earth by learning that one more pasuk. And that is why Torah needs chizit. Let's take the second one. Maisim tovim. Good deeds. You know, what, what's a good deed? From the time we're little children on, you know, it's like you help an old lady across the street, you know, and uh, someone needs you to help, help with some other issue and you help them. They needed help walking up a flight of stairs or opening the door, you know, helping cross the street. And you, you did all these things. So, you know, I did my symptom or, or many more complicated things. My symptom might have done many, many my symptom. And, and you know what happens sometimes? Sometimes you do a really good deed for somebody. You know, you hold the door for someone and they walk right past and they don't even say thank you. Or someone asks you for help with a particular problem and you spend time and effort in helping them solve that problem. And after you finish solving it, you never hear from them again. They never said thank you or anything. You could say to yourself, what? I did a good deed and I can't even get a thank you? Forget it. I'm not doing any good deeds anymore. Or another instance, someone needed a ride somewhere and you took them in your car and you drove with them to get to the place they needed to get to. They were going to a wedding and they had no way to get there. And it was in your neighborhood and you were going to take them and you brought them to the wedding. And on the way back from the wedding, you got into a fender bender, a minor accident. Sometimes a person would say, oh, just goes to show you, it doesn't pay to do good deeds. Look at this. I went out of my way. I drove to the wedding. I took my time off from my family, from my work, whatever. And this terrible thing happened. And so a person could say, forget it. I'm not doing any good deeds anymore. It doesn't pay. Good deeds need chizr. Because we don't do good deeds because we're helping someone else only. We're doing good deeds because we have to do good deeds no matter what happens. We have to do good deeds. And we're doing it because it's right to do. Not because we want to thank you. Not because we want a reward. None of that. Not because of that. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And I'll tell you one little story about this. It's very interesting. There's an article in one of the recent uh, newspapers about uh, Rabbi Yisrael Meirizhin, right? Uh, the, the great uh, Rizhiner Rebbe, Rebbe Yisrael. And uh, he, there was a man in town who was really poor and he was hardly making ends meet. And, uh, and, and one day he found a thousand rubles. A thousand rubles. A thousand rubles was like a million dollars. I don't even know if a million dollars is worth anything anymore, maybe. A, a thousand rubles changed his life, could change his life forever. The only thing is, you see, what happened was that there was a merchant who was in the religion of town about six months before who had a thousand rubles to buy merchandise in the town. And one day he looked in his wallet for the thousand rubles and they were gone. And they were lost. And he went to Rabbi Yisrael of origin asking, please give me a bracha, should help me find the, the money. And even with the bracha, he couldn't find the money. And so he said, that's it. I, I, I'll have to leave town. I'll leave town. I can't stay here forever. I have to go home. And, 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 and I lost my fortune, but what can I do? I, I lost it, but, but, but here's my address in case somebody finds it. In the meantime, six months later, this man finds the thousand rubles. So he comes to Rabbi Yisrael from religion. He says, let me ask you, Rabbi, lahalacha, according to law, am I allowed to keep these thousand rubles? I know it belonged to this merchant, but he left town. If he really was sincere about keeping it, he would have stayed in town. The fact that he left, does that mean he gave up hope? As we learned the famous sugya in the beginning, but here we know, we can assume he gave up hope. And once a person gives up hope, then it's finders keepers, losers weepers, right? Only, in, only under those circumstances. When you know a person gave up hope, see, yes, Rabbi Yisrael, do I? It's a, it's a thousand rubles. 
Do I have the right to keep it? So Yisrael thought for a minute, and he thought for a minute, and he realized that this man would possibly change his whole life for better. He was so poor in such bad shape. It would be great, but the halacha was that since the merchant had left an address and said, if anybody finds it, get in touch with me, it's obviously they didn't give up hope. And so he said, I'm sorry, the, the law is, you're gonna have to give it back to the merchant. So the merchant came to the town and the poor peddler took out the thousand rubles and in front of Rabbi Yisrael from Vision, he gave him the money. And the man was so appreciative that he got the money back that he told the, the poor person who found it, you know what? I want to tell you something. I, 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 I would have almost given up hope for this, but the halacha says it's mine. Thank you so much for returning it, but I want to give you a reward of a hundred rubles to help you get back on your feet. And the man said, I'm sorry, I, I won't take anything. What, what do you mean you won't take it? He says, you see, I only wanted to do the halacha. I didn't do this in order to get reward. I did it because whatever the halacha says, that's what I'm going to do. And since Rabbi Yisrael from Vision said that I have to give it back, it's all yours. I don't want a reward. That's mas and tovim. That's chizuk. That's strengthening because the person didn't do it because I want to get something back. It's not tit for tat. It's not you help me, I'll help you only. Of course, that's great. But even more, if something is the right thing to do, you do what's right. And that's Maas and Tov, and that needs chizuk. We need to strengthen ourselves that we're going to do the right thing with Maas and Tov. Now, tefillah, prayer, also needs chizuk. And it's obvious why. Because so often, we go and pray for things thinking that if I press the prayer button, Hashem is going to give me what I want. But that's not so. The Pesach says, every day we say it, you hear the prayers of your nation with mercy. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you Hashem, shomeya tefillah. You hear our prayers. Notice, Rav Osai, it doesn't say you grant our wishes. It doesn't say you answer our prayers in the affirmative. It just says shomeya tefillah. Hashem hears the prayer. And so we need chizuk sometimes. We need chizuk and strengthening and knowing that we're davening to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We hope and we pray all the things that are good for us in our opinion, that are good for Claudia Yisrael, that are good for the world will take place. But it's in the Yad Hashem. It's all up to Hashem. And our prayers can sometimes bring zechus merit to that which we desire and sometimes Hashem is just waiting for you to ask for it and that's why prayer is so crucial but if we don't get what we want we didn't pray davka only I'll only pray to you God if you do what I want otherwise I don't pray to you at all. oh come on that's not the definition of the bore olam that's not the definition of tov Hashem lakol v'racham ova l'kol ma'asov that God is kind and good to all. That's not tzaddik Hashem b'chol d'rachav, that God is righteous in all his ways. And that's why prayer needs chizuk. And finally, derech eretz. And any businessman or anyone who's tried anything can tell you, I studied to be a lawyer, but I ended up doing real estate deals. And when I went into real estate, the first 10 deals I made fell through and I lost all my money. If I would have given up, said the multimillionaire, I never would have achieved. Derek Eretz needs constant strengthening, occupation. Sometimes you study for an exam for a, an important step up on the academic ladder in order to Earn a higher salary, perhaps. And it doesn't always work. Do you give up? Oh, no. What you do is you go back to the books, you go study, you get through it again. How many times people take driving tests, law tests? How many times people take the medical boards and so on? 
And the same thing goes with an occupation. Person opens up a business as a plumber. I don't think plumbers don't make money, but let me tell you, I had a plumber here the other day. And in an hour, I was $150 uh, poorer. <laughs> it wasn't even an hour, it was actually 10 minutes. And I think to myself, I don't know, maybe I should go into, maybe I went to the wrong line. What's the point? The point is that we don't give up. We constantly try to make our lives better through occupation and other things. And we're supposed to have chizuk that Hashem is guarding and watching out for us. So these are the four things that are chazak, chazak, and this chazak. And now we're going to go immediately to our parsha. We're going to go back to the passage at the beginning of the sedja. And here it is. Now we begin. Eile pikudei hamishkan. Now, the translation of this means, the pikude means the count of. And of course, the safari translates the records of, but it's the same idea. These are the count or records of the mishkan. Mishkan ha'edus. The, the, the mishkan, which is from the word shechina, which means divine presence, or shochen, which means neighbor, because Hashem is our neighbor and his divine presence is very close to us. These are the accountings of the Mishkan, which was known as the Mishkan Ha'edus, the Mishkan of testimony. That's an interesting terminology. If we have a chance, perhaps later in the year, we'll discuss that one. And Asher Pukad al Pi Moshe, which was accounted for at the word of Moshe, Avodas HaLevian, the work of the Levian, the Yadi Soma ben Aaron HaKohen, in the hands of the Nasi of the Levian, who was known as Isamar, the son of Aaron HaKohen. Let's take a look at a Rashi on this particular Pasuk, and let's see what he says. Here it is. Look what Rashi says on HaMishkan Mishkan. All right, now, notice there's a double expression here, as we see again in the Pasuk. Here it is. It could have said, What's this? Mishkan Mishkan Why does it say it repetitively? These are the counts of the Mishkan, the Mishkan Ha'edus. So for that, once again, we go to the Rashi right over here, which says, HaMishkan Mishkan Shnei Pa'amim. Rashi jumps on this very redundant word and he says it says it two times and of course he's begging the question why does it say it twice he gives it the answer based on a medrash tanchuma and the answer is this ramaz remez it's a hint it this these two expressions of mishkan are a hint to the base hamikdash shenismashkan or shenismashkan which was taken as a mashkon. Those of us who remember, we learned from Metzia, we learned a mashkon is a guarantee, a surety. It's collateral. Which was taken as collateral, or as the Sepharia translates it, as a pledge, same idea. That was taken as a collateral by the destruction of the two but they migdash alavon osayim shal Yisrael because of the sins of the Jewish people. What is Rashi saying here? He's saying here that Hashem took the base hamigdash Rishon and the base hamigdash Sheni and destroyed them as a pledge or a surety, a collateral, because of the sins. Of the Jewish people. Well, if the Jewish people sinned, why didn't he destroy the Jewish people? Why, why didn't he just get rid of the sinners? And every Jew is responsible for every other Jew. Why didn't he just, why didn't he just get rid of them? I want to share you another thing. Let's take a look over here. Let's take a look over here. I'm going to show you. To heal him. Ayin Tess, the first Pusuk. And we're going to read a few pasukim here and kill a mind test. Tell me, as soon as I read this pasuk, I want you to ask a question, okay? As soon as I read the first pasuk, I want you to ask me a question. Here we go. Mizmar la'asa. A song. The word mizmar is a zemer. A song to asaf. 
Asaf is one of the authors of some chapters of Tehillim. Asaf was actually a progeny of the, you could say even infamous, Korach, the rebellious Korach. But Asaf was a tzaddik of his future. And this Mala a song to Asaf, and it begins like this. Elokim, Hashem, Bo Ugoyim ben The Goyim have come into your inheritance. Timu es They have defiled the dwelling place of your holiness. Samu es Yerushalayim le'iyim. They have made Jerusalem into ruins. Okay, guys, we got to think about this. Let's go back to the beginning of the passage and ask you a question. A song to Asaf. Elohim, God, the Goyim have come into your inheritance. They've defiled your holy place. They've made Jerusalem into ruins. What's wrong with this passage? Why does it say Mizmar la Asaf? Mizmar means a song. Oh, it should say something like Kino la Asaf. It's a dirge. It's a kinnis. Like on like on Tishabov. What do we do? We say kinnis because Jerusalem was destroyed. We don't say Mizmorim. In fact, we skip certain Mizmorim. Why does this begin with Mizmorim? And by the way, this parrot goes on to say more and more terrible things. Look at this. They've taken the corpses of the Jewish people for the Vultures up in heaven, the Sarcha Sitcha Lachaisa Oretz, and the flesh of your righteous ones have been given to be eaten by the wild beasts of the field. Their blood's been spilled all over the place. Nobody is, is been buried. We become, you know, ashamed for our neighbors, and everybody makes fun of us, and so on. And so on and so on. So the question is, uh, why I, does it say Mizmar L'Asaf, a song? It should say Kino L'Asaf. And we're going to see this in a moment. I want to show you something. We're going to learn a little piece of Gemara. Let's see if we can get it right now. Okay, let's see if we can get it. Uh, do you see the Gemara? No. You don't see no. it? Okay, we're going, to, we're, going to have to, we're going to have to highlight it in order to get it. Give me a moment and we'll get it in a moment. Okay, we're going to highlight it. And get it in a moment. We have to, what we have to do is, of course, stop this share and get to the next share. So we'll come right now. We'll get it now. We're going to get it. Here it is. All right. And now we have it right here. Here it is. Okay. Here is Masech the Kedushin. I want to learn a little piece of Gemara with you, if you don't mind. We're going to start on the bottom of Lamed Aleph, Lamed Aleph. All right. It's a very interesting little piece of Gemara. That's a story, in a way. And let's take a look at it. Look at this piece of uh, Gemara. We're going to start with Tani Abimi, Berei de Rebbe Abahu. Abimi, the son of Rebbe Abahu, learned the following. Yesh macha la'oviv, or la'imo, the someone who could feed his parents, visione, uh, fat birds, fat food, best, you know, best, you can take them out to the Fanciest restaurant. Nevertheless, the Tardom in Ha'olam. He can ruin him. He can destroy him. V'yesh matchino bechayim. And there are some sons that will have their fathers turn the mill. Umevi. Now we're on Lamed Beis Lamed Beis. Umevi lechayolam abo. But he can actually bring his father into Olam Habo. Right. He honors him in such a way, even though his father has to work so hard, but he brings him to Olam Abba. It's reminiscent of a parent who helps support a child who is going to be able to go to learn. Or in American terminology, he will work his bone off in order to have his child have a good education, to pay for yeshiva. If the child wants to go to yeshiva and his parents are working so hard to spend tuition money, and he's bringing his parent to Olam Abba, even though the parent is working so hard. And the Gemara continues. Let's take a look at this fascinating piece of Gemara. 
Amar Rabbi Abo, Rabbi Abo said, Kagon Abini Beri, take a look at my son Abini. Hold the names, people. Rabbi Abo had a son named Abini. Kagon Abini Beri, my son Abini, Kaye Mitzvah's Kibbid Kibbud. He fulfills the Mitzvah of Kibbid Avain, Chamisha Bene Samchi Avale. You should, Abini, you should know the Chaye Oven. My son Abini had five sons who were all brilliant Talmidei Chacham, and they all had smicha. This means, not the smicha we have today, but the Emes of smicha that came from the Tanoim and Amoraim all the way back, right? He said he had five sons, Vichy Hava Osa, Rebbe Abo, but when his father, Rebbe Abo, would come to the house, Kori Ababa, the father would say, Rahid, uh, uh, the, the son Abini would say, Rahid, Ozil, Uposachle. He would run to the door and open it for his father, even though he had five strong young men, children who had smicha. He would run for his father to open the door, right? The Omar, he'd say, In, in, yeah, yes, 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 hold on, yes. Like when somebody knocks on the door, yes, I'll be right there, right? So he said, Ad the Mati Hasam. Until he would get there, he would say, yes, yes, I'm coming. Now watch this. Yom Chad, one day, Omale, the father said to the son, Ashkayin Maya, let's drink some water. The father wanted a drink of water. So he said, let's have some water. So the son ran and got him a drink of water. By the time he went to the sink, at that time the sink was outside in the well, he got the water and he brought it inside till he brought him the water and then name. Right? The father began to doze off. Father dozed off while he went to get the water. You know? Okay. And what happened? The son was standing over the father with the cup of water and he wouldn't move until the father woke up and he was able to give him a drink. This great act of Kibbut Av is told to us what the reward was. Look at this. Says the Gavara, is Taya Milsa. He was fortunate and successful, says the Gavara, the Darash Abimi. And Abimi came and made the following drasha. Mizmala Asa. Oh, here's our poster. A song to Asa. Amale. Hi. Hey. Hey. Please, please mute. Please mute. Thank you. Otherwise, we'll have to mute everybody. Right. Please mute. Okay. Now, okay. We're going to stop right there. He said, Ms. Rashi is Rashi over here quotes a Gemara. Actually, it's a Medrash. And he quotes the following Medrash. Okay. He says, as follows, he says, the Darash Kach. Here's what he made in Russia. Follow me along. She Omar Asaf, Shira Asaf said a song. Al She Kila Hakadosh Baruch Hu Chamaso that Hashem took out his anger. Right. The Eitzim Va'avonecha. On the wood and stones of Shebeveso that were in the base Hamigdash. Umi toch kach. And because of that, Hochzar Shechina the Israel. That's why the Shechina was able to return to the Jewish people. The Ilmole kach, if not for this, Lonishtair Misone Yisrael Sarid, there would not leave over for the Jewish people a remnant at all. The folks say, do you hear this? Abimi said, you know why Asaf was singing? Asaf wasn't happy over the destruction of Jerusalem. Asaf wasn't happy over the destruction of people. On the contrary, he was terribly upset. But he recognized that within that terrible destruction were the seeds of redemption. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu took his anger out on the wood and on the stones, and not on the people. He took it out on the building of the base on English and said, erase the building, but don't erase my children. 
because the children of Israel are going to go from country to country throughout the world, and they're going to make the world a better place everywhere they go. Because in every single country that the Jewish people have gone to over all the centuries, what they've done is they brought wisdom and prosperity and peace to every country that treated them properly. And I may add to anyone who's a student of history, you know that as soon as their stay is made unwelcome, that's the end of that country. Think about it, people. Let's go back. Egypt, Babylon, Rome, all of Europe and Asia, Spain, England, France, Germany. Germany. What prosperity they had. How much good there was. But then they picked on the Jews. And what happened? The country was this negative. negative. It, it was ruined. Spain was once the golden age in Spain, one of the wealthiest nations in the, in the world. It's, it's a pauper nation compared to what it was. The Spanish Armada was invincible. And yet they lost only 100 years after the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492. By 1588, the English de defeated them miserably. And the English didn't last too much longer either. They had a great power, but they expelled the Jews. And they didn't treat us right. And consequently, their land and power was diminished. And Germany, and Yitz Hashem Russia, and all the other wicked nations, the Arabs who are so evil to the host country that treats them so well and, and gave them so much prosperity when before the land was arid and desolate and, and devoid of any vegetation. And look at it, how we made the desert bloom because that's what Kla Yisrael does. It brings blessings wherever it goes. And when Hashem gets angry at the Jews, he doesn't destroy them. He destroys the Eitz and the Abonim. Okay, we can now go back to our Pesach and we see the Rashi on that Pesach that we said before, he's masking them, Shnei Pa'amen, Remez Lemigdash, and Mishnashkein, Mishnei Chorbanan. It's a hint to the two Batei Migdash that were destroyed by the two destructions that took place in the first and second base of Migdash. So this Mizmar Le'osa is really a very happy, in a sense, Tehillim, it's a song, because we're singing, thank you, Hashem, for keeping us around, giving us life, that we're still here to tell and to bring the world to a better place. It's a song. And so, you know, maybe even in our own personal lives, when things don't go the way we want and the way we would like them. No! I'm asking, please mute. We're going to have to mute. You're gonna be, you, you, exactly. You're going to be eating my dessert, by the way. Okay, we're going to have some chocolate souffle. Chocolate souffle. Uh, yeah. Right now. Okay. No. All right. Everybody's muted now. If you want to unmute, you have to do it on your own. Keep telling people when you're on this sheer, try not to talk. Anyway, in our personal lives, the same thing could happen that, you know, sometimes we, we suffer something everyone suffered something and and we and in a way we, we we really have to be thankful it's only that we really have to be thankful that hashem knows these the master plan we make the mistakes but hashem has the master plan i just saw a, a little blurb that was said by the, the holy uh, Talmud Chacham of Aaron Lipiansky Shlita, who, who said so beautifully, he said, you know, in the end result, Claudius Israel is going to survive everything. And in the end result, there's no question that we're going to return to Yerushalayim, Ir HaKodesh, from Hei Rebbe Yemenu. There's no question about it. There's no question that at some point in the future, if not immediately, but soon, the Beis HaMikdash Hashlishi is going to be rebuilt, no question about it. But in the meantime, there's a mishkan mishkan ha'edus. There is a collateral that Hashem is taking to
to guarantee that we recognize that he doesn't take his anger against us, but against the Eitzim and the Avonim. I'd like to go ahead to Tevik Lamed Tes, Pasuk Lamed Beis, and we're going to go back to our Sukkim here, and we're going to go ahead and try quickly to get to Pasuk Lamed Beis over here. We're almost there. Here we go. And the Pasuk says as follows. Very, very interesting. By the way, what, well, when you read when you read this Parsha, I want you to do me a favor. Count how many times the Pasuk says, Kasher Tzivo Hashem Es Moshe. There are so many times in Parshat Pakude that the Pasuk says, Kasher Tzivo Hashem Es Moshe, more than in any other Parsha in the entire Torah. Is 18? There's a lot. I don't, I, I don't know oh. the exact number now. Oh. Could be 18. You can count them up and let me know, but there, it's it's enormous amount of times. But this one is unique. This one is really unique, and I want to I want to explain why. Okay. Right. The pasuk says like this. Let's take a look at this pasuk. It's right here. Vatechel kol avodes mishkan ol moed. Where's my little hand? There we go. Vatechel kol avodes mishkan ol moed, and all the work of the Mishkan in the tent of the meeting was complete. That's Vatecha, like by Yechulu, right? So Vatecha means it was all completed, right? Vayasu b'nei Yisrael k'chol asher tziva Hashem es Moshe k'nosu. This is unusual terminology. And the b'nei Yisrael did k'chol asher tziva Hashem es Moshe. All that Hashem commanded Moshe came or soon, so they did. This is a very repetitive process. Is that in the Gomorrah? Also, well, what are you saying? Sorry. We're looking at the Gomorrah. Oh, you don't see the process? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll have to get it for you. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought I, I thought I thought just by clicking it, I was going to get it. Thank you so much for telling me that. I'm going to go back and get it right now. Okay, here it is. Thank you for telling me that. Excellent. Here it is. Okay. So here it is. Thank you. Here we go. Call, uh, you see it now? Now you see it, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. But the Chal Kol Avodas Mishkan Oel Moed, it's Perik Lamed Tes Posuk Lamed Beis, and all the work of the Oel Moed was completed by Yasu Bnei Yisrael, and the Bnei Yisrael did Kechol HaShet Siva Hashem Es Moshe, all that Hashem committed Moshe, Kain Osu, so they did. How many times do you have to say this? Right? And what's the connection with all the work of the Mishkan was completed, and then the Bnei Yisrael did whatever Hashem commanded Moshe, so they did. Well, what's the connection between the completion of the building of the Mishkan and, and then this statement, all that Hashem committed Moshe, so they did? What, what, what's the connection here? Okay, so the Imre Shefer. 18. It was 18. 18 times? Yeah, I was right. Yeah. Thank you, Mordechai. There we go. 18 times in one sedge. I knew we were going to come up with the right number. Heights 11. Here we go. Okay. So, the Imre Shefer comes along and he explains so beautifully. Listen to this. We know that the building of the Mishkan was the establishment of the kingdom of Hashem, of Hashem on earth. We also know, based on Vayakel, like we learned last week, that even though the building of the Mishkan was vital for the future continuance of the divine presence on earth, it couldn't take the place of Shabbos. Shabbos, the work stopped. It didn't take the place of Shabbos. So for Shabbos, all the work stopped. The reason why all the work stopped is because Shabbos is more important than even the building of the Mishkan. Yet, we know that throughout the Talmud, we find the statement of Chazal, kol ha'osek b'mitzvah, poter min ha'mitzvah. Anyone who's involved in a mitzvah is poter free from another mitzvah. One of the famous uh, Places that that's brought up, of course, is taken the Sechta Sukkah, 
if someone is watching a chola, chola umishamsha, a sick person, or someone who has to care for the sick person, potter mina sukkah. You are free from sitting in the sukkah because you can't leave a sick person, God forbid, especially if it's a chola shiyesh plus hakana, you can't leave him. And so when you're osik for mitzvah, you're potter min ha mitzvah. You might think, you might think that the building of the Mishkan is such a great mitzvah, you should be potter from keeping Shabbos. No. That's why there's a special plus in Vayakha which says that even though you're building the Mishkan, Shabbos takes precedence. And even though the building of the Mishkan is a mitzvah, Shabbos takes precedence. But once the Mishkan was complete, now, I can't say I'm involved in the Mishkan and I'm free from the other mitzvahs. Maybe I could have said that with everything but Shabbos. Shabbos, I couldn't stop. But I couldn't say that about all the other mitzvahs. So look what the Pasuk says. Mishkan All the work of the Olmo is completed. Now, there's no more such thing as Oseg B'mitzvah, Pater Mena Mitzvah. Therefore, at this point, Vayasu B'nei Yisrael K'chol Asher Tziva Hashem Es Moshe Kenesu. And now all the B'nei Yisrael did all the mitzvahs that they were required to do because now they didn't have the excuse of Oseg B'mitzvah, Pater Mena Mitzvah. And they eagerly went and did all that Hashem commanded Moshe, all the mitzvahs, all that they were required to do, Kenosu. This is a very, very important lesson because in our history, like here in the United States of America, the ones who built Torah observance in this country were the people who arrived at these shores penniless without access to the language, without capability of communicating with the larger population of the United States, and yet the Jewish people, by virtue of their efforts, built a great legacy. But the greatest legacy was built by those who refused to work on Shabbos and who didn't allow the Shabbos to get in the way of their making the living. They kept the Shabbos and they suffered monetary deprivation, but they had a legacy that was more important to them than the money. I'll never forget, share with you a personal story. I was sitting shiv in the tank of dach for my father. I believe it was 1975. My father had a little stand, not a store, but a stand on Orchard Street. Across the street from his little stand, by the way, those of you who know Yochai Givon, Yochai Givon had a little, had a store across the street. At that time, I didn't know him, he didn't know me, but later we, did, we I refreshed, he refreshed my memory about the store, but that's not the one I'm talking about. But across the street, two stores away from Yochai's in-law store, there was a fellow with a hat store. Hats were very big at that time. Before John F. Kennedy came along, every president wore a hat. You know, every businessman, everybody wore a hat. Hats were a big business. And this fellow made a, a, a lot of money. He had a, a, a great business. I'm not going to mention his name, but he had a great business. But he kept open shops. Orchard Street in the Lower East Side of Manhattan was a two-day-a-week street. It was a the, the, the two days were Saturday and Sunday, Shabbos and Sunday. My father, he closed up with that little stand on Shabbos and he'd go home. And when he would go home, this guy across the street, this Jew across the street would say, hey, you, 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 don't you care about your family? You know how much money you could make if you would keep open tomorrow? Yeah, what are you doing? You think you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do well for your family? You, you're never going to make it big because you only have one day you're missing out on the big Saturday and so on and so forth. My father didn't listen to the word. He was friends with the guy, but he said, I'm sorry. Shabbos is more important. And he would leave every single Friday. So I'm sitting shiva. And this fellow 
sends a letter to my mother. He didn't even come to the house, but he sent a letter. And he wrote a letter that says something along the following lines. I can't remember word for word, but the following what he said. He said, you know, every Friday when Saul would close the store, I would yell at him and say, what are you doing? What are you giving up? Look at me. I have a big house on Long Island. I own a couple of cars. My kids are in the best colleges. What are you doing to your family? But he didn't listen. He didn't listen. He closed the store and he went home. And I want to tell you something. He did the right thing. And I'm sorry I didn't do that. Because I have, I have cars and I have a big house. But none of my children marry Jews. I don't have one Jewish grandchild. They don't even talk to me. They think I'm from another generation. And they're embarrassed because I don't have an education like they have. But your family respected the Shabbos. And so they were able to garner respect. Yes, Rabosai. That's what this passage is telling us. All the work of the Mishkan was finished. The most important legacy we can leave to our children is the legacy of the Bnei Yisrael keeping the mitzvahs kechol asher tziva Hashem es Moshe kein osu. All that was commanded by Hashem to Moshe, that's what they did. And that's why the people who were, in, who, who were sticklers for keeping to the Shabbos, even though it meant that they would be poor in comparison, although they managed to make a living and they suffered plenty, but they passed on something that was more valuable than any amount of cash you can even imagine. We wouldn't sell the Shabbos for a hundred million dollars. If someone came over to you and said, be Michal Shabbos, I'll give you 10 million dollars right here. You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. Imagine that. Does anybody in this world think about the greatness of the soul of the Jewish people that's like that? Unbelievable. But that's why we're still here. That's why the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Phoenicians, the, the barbarians, the Romans, the Greeks, the Greeks, no, no more Greeks, no more Romans. Can you imagine that? None of them, the Spanish, but well, nothing, nothing. The Jewish people, the center of the world to this day. It's unbelievable because Hashem made it that way. And as long as we stick with that, we're going to be in great shape. Okay, what a what a wonderful opportunity to end Chumash uh, on this high note of the ultimate great good for the future of Klal Yisrael. So uh, I want you to uh, have a great Shabbos, everybody. We wish oh. you the very best. Any questions or comments at this point? Uh, just a, a, a note that uh, on Sunday morning, if you're in the neighborhood, uh, I'll be speaking in the Kingsway Jewish Center at about 9.30, 945 about the greatness of Rav Moshe Feinstein and you're more than welcome to come and enjoy at the Kingsway Jewish Center Kings Highway and Nostrum Avenue so if you're interested you're more than welcome to come at that point otherwise I wish everyone a wonderful good Shabbos Shabbat Shalom have a wonderful thank you it's so inspiring thank you thank you thank Thank you you. thank you for saying that I appreciate that Hashem should continue to inspire Kla Yisrael Amen. Have 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 a great great day a good Shabbos everybody. Amen. Okay, thank you. Okay, good night. Welcome. You're welcome.